Kim Servart uh, Terio is an associate professor of art history, theory, and criticism at Dominican University in River Forest, Illinois. She completed her doctorate at the University of Virginia in 2000 with her dissertation, Replacing Arshil Gorky, Exile, Identity, and Abstraction in 20th Century American Art, and has presented numerous lectures on the artist, including at the College Art Association Annual Conference in New York City and Atlanta, National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., the University of London, Oxford University, uh, UCLA, the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art, and she delivered the Library of Congress 15th Annual Vartan Anste Armenian Lecture on September 28, 2010. That was recently. That's where you got your cold? Washington tends to do that, yeah. Dr. Theriot's article, Arshil Gorky's Self-Fashioning, the name, naming, and other epithets, appears in the 2006 Journal for the Society of Armenian Studies, and she has contributed a chapter uh, entitled Art Criticism and the Other, Arshil Gorky's Primitive, Feminine, and Oriental to the Anthology, Essentialism, Race, and Identity. She was invited to participate in the Arshil Gorky Festival held in conjunction with the 2006 Armenian Museum and, uh, Museum and Fresno Art Museum's exhibition of Gorky's work, during which she appeared on a panel discussing the artist and his work. She co-chaired a conference session with curator Michael Taylor, uh, curator of the Arshil Gorky, a retrospective uh, exhibit, was that, for uh, 2000. Eight College Art Association Annual Conference. For the exhibition catalogued organized by the Philadelphia Museum of Art, she contributed the essay, Exile, Trauma, and Arshil Gorky, or Gorky's, The Artist and His Mother. That's one of his most famous uh, pieces, as far as I know. Um, well, I do have an art historian wife, so some, somehow some things have, mm -hmm. you know, etched in. You know. Her book on the artist, Rethinking Arshil Gorky, offers new interpretive insights into Gorky's work, elaborating upon the themes of displacement, trauma, and memory, as well as identified issues of identity, originality, and mourning. These are key to her investigation of Gorky and interpretation of modern art and modernism. She has completed numerous art reviews, a book review in art journal on the Gorky biographies, all published in the last decade, and also writes on the subject of myth, memory, and trauma in relation to the Vietnam veteran memorial, Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. She has published articles and delivered uh, presentations on this topic as well. Uh, join me in welcoming... Professor Terio. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so my voice is slightly hoarse, and I'm I'm. Uh, it doesn't affect what I say, but I might have to stop and, and get a drink of water or something a little more often than I might. And you're going to f uh, smell the faint smell of eucalyptus <coughs> as I open up my little herbal uh, eucalyptus towelette just so that I make sure that I can breathe through my whole presentation, so. Okay, well, I wanted to just start um, by showing you an image of the abstract expressionist stamps. Um, this came up in a conversation, the class that I attended this morning. And um, just make sure that you all know that um, after the the retrospective exhibition of Gorky's work that was that opened in Philadelphia that traveled to the Tate Modern and just closed at the Los Angeles uh, Museum of Contemporary Art um, really um, seems to have um, solidified Gorky's place in art history, um, particularly in some new ways. And um, a kind of in conjunction with that, he was one of the artists that was selected for the U.S. Postal Service uh, Abstract Expressionist Stamps. And you can see his work, um, the third from the left, and I'll give you a close-up here. And there it is. This is the liver is the Cox comb. It was painted in 1944. It's owned by the Albright Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo. And this is actually the painting that started me thinking about and wondering about Arshil Gorky. I was a graduate student desperate for a paper topic for a class, Art Between the Wars, and I found myself standing in front of this work and trying to figure out what it 
what it was about, what was going on with the artist process, um, as well as to try to understand the artist's identity. And as I um, spent more time researching the artist, I found that there seemed to be um, lack of information in some places, misconceptions as I understood it in other places. So um, this is kind of where things started for me. So I'm going to talk about that and uh, in the end probably argue that Gorky's not, uh, not actually an abstract expressionist, but we'll get started with that. And I'm just going to finish, uh, let that finish over there. Take a drink of water. <laughs> it's okay, we're doing fine. Even better, yeah. You know, I need to be able to see my, my sheet anyway, so it's fine. A long time has passed since Arshil Gorky's sister Vartouche argued with the staff of the Museum of Modern Art in the mid-1950s, insisting that the artist's nationality on the wall label to the 1947 painting Agony was incorrect and should be changed from Russian to Armenian. It is now clear, mainly through the insistence of Gorky's relatives, that Gorky was from the Vaughan region of historic Armenia. Currently, most museums label the works Arshil Gorky, American, born Armenia, and some even list his original surname of Vosinik Adoyan. But what do such labels mean for Gorky's art? If he wasn't Russian, but he had a Russian name, and he was an Armenian, but he was from Turkey, yet all of his work was completed in America, these implications are problematic. Even Gorky's place in modernist art history is ambiguous and changing. For example, Gorky has been situated as the last surrealist and the first abstract expressionist. Indeed, it was André Bataille, the leader of the surrealists, who wrote in the introduction to Gorky's first one-man show at the Levy Gallery in 1946, those who love easy solutions will find slim pickings here. The crucial element that underlies such confusion and that has never been sufficiently addressed is the core interpretive problem of displacement and identity within Gorky's biographer, biography. What exactly did it mean to be an immigrant, an Armenian immigrant, in the United States when Gorky arrived in 1920? For Gorky, like so many Armenians, being in America meant having been forcibly driven from ancestral lands by the Ottoman Turks, escaping from years of oppression and racism endorsed and promulgated by the Turkish government, and surviving the Armenian genocide, which meant torture, rape, and the full gamut of crimes against humanity. Painting in the United States from 1920 to 1948, Gorky is mainly known for his unfortunate biography, which always accompanies explanations of his work. He was born Armenian in Turkey prior to the Armenian Genocide of 1915. His father fled to America to avoid conscription in the Turkish army. And for Armenian men, this meant that you were worked to death on a work brigade, building roads and, and doing other such things. Gorky and the remainder of his family fled on a death march, and the popular story is that his mother died of starvation in his arms before he and his younger sister finally made it to America. Around 1925, the young immigrant changed his name and moved to New York City to become an artist. He then began to make up stories of his artistic training, saying, for instance, that he had studied with the Russian artist Vasily Kandinsky when he had no formal training whatsoever. And he, he made up these stories or kind of told these stories at the same time he was developing into one of the most progressive painters in America during the 1930s. The Surrealists, who had come to the United States during World War II, embraced his late career work of the 1940s. Gorky's life ended in a triad of tragedy. In January 1946, he lost most of his newest work in a studio fire. He had a colostomy operation for rectal cancer that March. And finally, after a car accident in June 1948, which temporarily paralyzed his painting arm, Gorky hanged himself in July. Okay. 
Gorky's biography is so often cited that it overshadows investigations of his work, yet it remains important because it is inextricably linked to his art. Simple biographical accounts, however, although informative, do not go far enough. In my book, Rethinking Arshel Gorky, I assert that Gorky's art is a barometer of his existence that measures his relationship to the world as a displaced person trying to build a new life for himself, a victim of trauma who bases his art on memories, a determined modern artist who enlists art to overcome his status as an outsider, and an artist who employs abstraction to resol resolve the dilemmas of his personal drama. But also he had a deep love for art, art making and art itself that drove him continuously to make art. Gorky had an uneasy relationship with his past that is mired by complications of his ethnic identity. Certainly, such a view is substantiated by Gorky's own evasion of the subject. Very few, including his second wife, were initially aware of his history. A study of the Armenian, of Armenian genocide survivors published in 1996 in the Journal of Traumatic Stress suggests that individuals did not speak about their experience as a result of not being able to express uh, rage or resist the genocide when it had occurred, leaving them feeling impotent, or they were afraid they would cry, be judged as weak, or be devalued or stigmatized because they had been victimized. Consistent with trauma survivors, Gorky did not discuss the Armenian genocide, nor did he depict it in his work. For the most part, Gorky avoided the painful parts of his past, instead painting lyrical works that paid homage to his homeland. His avoidance of trauma and focus on a nostalgic version of the past free from pain revealed just how traumatized Gorky was. He functioned by blocking unpleasant memories out of his psyche in a manner that reflects post-traumatic stress disorder and memory repression. The bifurcated condition of displacement led Gorky to grapple with his position in the new world, and this was successfully applied to and expressed through his art. As with the characters in Richard Hogolpian's 1952 novel, Far Away the Spring, the difficulty of Gorky's displacement plays out through his existence as an artist. In the novel, Dr. Danielian, the Six Setrak, and Mariam talk of life in the new world. Mariam ob observes, it is a strange world that most of us have come to, a place we don't really understand. Perhaps that is why some of us behave the way we do. The doctor replies, of course it is different to be in one's own country, but when we have no country, we must live as best we can. Gorky lived as best he could through his art, and in doing so, contributed to the development of American modernism. Not only was Gorky displaced from his homeland, but when Gorky arrived in America, he was also displaced from both the Armenian community in America and the American mainstream because of his aspirations to become an artist. Gorky's first biographer, his nephew Colin Moredian, insists that Gorky's mother had exposed him as a boy to Armenian art and had encouraged him to become an artist. And here you see him painting in the backyard of his uh, sister's home in Watertown, Massachusetts. And here is what is believed to be some of the things that he had been exposed to, um, perhaps uh, with trips to the, his ancestral vank, uh, Shrahan Surpnishan, uh, or to Akhtamar, which you're seeing on the right, which isn't far from where he grew up in Khorkum. In America, however, general Armenian ideals were different. Many Armenians settled in communities such as the Boston suburb of Watertown, Massachusetts, where Gorky initially lived with his older sister. It was here that Gorky quickly took up the task of becoming an artist when most able-bodied young men in the community were generally expected to finish school or go right into family businesses or factory work to help support the family. An early painting by Gorky like the impressionistic Park Street Church of 1924, is not only an example of Gorky's persistence, but is also indicative of Gorky's desire, almost immediately upon his arrival, to explore the new styles of art available to him in the United States. So this is kind of an example of American impressionism, and you can see that by the broad diagonal strokes that you're seeing. So he probably went to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, looked at American impressionism, and was trying to learn how to make that 
that by kind of replicating it in this work here. And by the way, this work is owned by the Whistler House Museum, which is in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is the sweetest little house museum. Um, if you haven't been, if you end up in New England, I really, really suggest you go. Um, it was in the exhibition that traveled, the Gorky Retrospective exhibition, but I believe um, all of those works have been returned at this point, so it will probably be on display there now. In Portrait of the Artist and His Imaginary Wife, dated by Gorky in 1942, as painted in 1923, but generally accepted as later, Gorky shows that he realized what was to some extent the irretrievability of his former destiny. Oh, and in terms of the dating, Gorky often wanted it to appear that his art and his development was more advanced than it was, so he would often if a painting wasn't dated, he would actually date it like a decade before he actually painted it. So, um, so it looked like he had this brilliance when he was younger. The imaginary wife uh, here appears as an apparition of the woman he could no longer meet because the genocide killed her or because she didn't exist in America. Gorky's mourning for this lost life is evident by his depiction of himself with lowered head, shadowed face, and heavy eyelids. I believe that the eyelids actually refer to a saying that Gorky both spoke and wrote, you rest on my eyelids, which meant basically thinking of you weighs heavily upon me, and refers to his displacement. This terminology is from a poem by Edouard entitled Lady Love, but also seems to be a colloquial expression that might have existed in some similar form in Armenian. Such melding of language seems to suggest the process of Gorky's thinking and manner in which he addressed his life and art. When Gorky moved to New York by 1925 to become an artist, he taught himself Western art by analyzing it in museums, galleries, art books, and reproductions. Unlike European or American artists who received extensive formal training and were introduced to important artists by their teachers, Gorky chose for himself the artists that interested him and that he decided were worthy of study. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, these artists that he chose included old masters, 19th century academic painters, and eventually the uh, European early modern masters, such as Cezanne, Matisse, and Picasso. <coughs> <coughs> Here's an early uh, uh, self-portrait of the artist, and he is showing himself um, there with a palette, the remnants of a kind of palette in his hand. And it's similar to other uh, works by Picasso and Cezanne, other self-portraits. And actually, it's pretty a traditional form in art history, the artist painting himself, him or herself, holding the palette to suggest, again, the vocation. Just as he was an immigrant who must learn a new language in his new country, Gorky set about to learn art by accumulating a visual vocabulary that he could eventually integrate into his own compositions. As a burgeoning modernist artist, Gorky deemed it necessary that uh, at, at that time to see what, became, what came before him, to learn it, address it, and most importantly, move beyond it. And this is why he starts painting in the style of other artists that, as a way to kind of teach himself. So here you see landscape in the manner of Cezanne from 1927 that is very similar to um, the way that Cezanne painted. So Cezanne is <coughs> excuse me, a post-impressionist from uh, before the turn of the century, essentially most of his work and development before the turn of the century into the 20th century. And here he is constructing this in a planar form. I don't think I have a pointer, but. You can see here that there, you have the central uh, tree here, but the branches and even the background are depicted in terms of flat planes. And this was a development of Cezanne that actually eventually led to the Cubist um, art and the development of, of Cubism. Um, they didn't use whole planes um, in their work. They kind of broke things up a little bit more, but this is kind of where it started. And here's another example. Uh, on the right is an example of a Cezanne. And you can see the way that he's kind of breaking up space and reconstructing space in these kind of planar terms. 
A significant comparison can be made between that of, of Picasso's studio of 1928 and Gorky's organization of 1936. Although in organization there is a corresponding underlying structure defined by black lines, and Gorky adopts the motifs of Picasso's doorknobs and breast-like forms, each serve a very different purpose in Gorky's work. Gorky redistributes the motifs as points that accent and exploit the compositional structure of the painting because they connect the black line at intersection or endpoints. <coughs> so here you have what the doorknob and Gorky has put it right over here. Um, here you kind of have a table and a back wall with paintings on it. This yeah. is probably a bust. And Gorky has abstracted it here um, and changed the space. So there isn't really that much of a sense of space. <coughs> uh, no, the one on the right is the Picasso. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a little bit light on that. So um, what happens is the black line in organization is less descriptive of objects than the Picasso, which allowed Gor Gorky to transcend Picasso by extending more fully into the language of abstraction. And the work on the right is a Gorky. It's a drawing, and it's actually a preparatory drawing for organization that, that Gorky made that is a drawing of a bicycle. It's a disassembly of a bicycle, and you can kind of see this wacky wheel here. Mm -hmm. Here is the spoke, here's the chain. Um, so he's also looking at objects in front of him or in the world around him and kind of dissecting and abstracting those and thinking about how those can also work into his composition. Um, so, and I talk about this as or organizing aesthetics, and um, I, talk, I discuss this a little bit more fully in the book. <coughs> Perhaps because Gorky was from outside the culture in which he practiced art, he was uninhibited by the label master, which enabled him to, e to evaluate and build upon how others worked. As with his own students, whose works Gorky often repainted instead of critiqued, Gorky looked at the composition, representation, and stylistic elements of others. This tendency relates both to his desire to connect with modernism and his need to form his own artistic identity, simultaneously accepting and denying a visual heritage, perhaps because he had had his heritage taken, taken from him and he still remained in exile. Along with this, as indicated by the preliminary drawing of organization, Gorky was integrating his real world and present experience in America into his work as well. Paradoxically, the freedom that such detachment from the culture offered, to be able to step back and choose one's own path in addition to the parts of the culture one might embrace, enhanced Gorky's marginality. For instance, as if to authenticate his displacement, Gorky had changed his name to Arshel Gorky from his Armenian name of Vosnik Adoyan around the time he moved to New York City in 1925, distancing himself from his old Armenian identity and his new, uh, his new Armenian identity in America. Change, changing his name to Gorky, Russian for bitter, which perhaps reflected his attitude about his exile, allowed him to maintain an otherness and perhaps explain his thick accent, but it also helped separate him from his American Armenian heritage because his expectations, which now reflected American values, were detached from his original Armenian culture anyway. So it was a more kind of capitalist uh, endeavor. Um, as well as the fact that so many images of, of, if anyone knew what an Armenian was at that time, it was often a st the starving Armenian that they saw in the, um, in the newspapers. What did the name Adoyan really mean in America anyway? Certainly, there was little left of Vosinik Adoyan. Many Armenian names, which end in I-A-N or Y-A-N, meaning of or from, designate an individual of or from a specific place or people, a necessary and natural link between the individual and culture, a direct correspondence of form and meaning. In his home village of Khorkum, Adoyan would have uh, defined Gorky's lineage, referring to an economic and social history of his father's ancestors, which was interrupted by genocide. The name of Vosinik, denoted Gorky's mother's home of Vostan. Her family had produced a line of priests for a millennium, and that too had ended with genocide. Besides, 
Gorky's first name had already been replaced once when he was a boy. When his grandfather, Adoyan, died, Gorky was given the patriarch's name, Manuk. This uh, both denied the identity of the individual and was, uh, who was renamed, and in this case, it also denied his mother's heritage and embraced the identity of one part of his heritage, in effect, skewing Gorky's identity in such a way that he was in some sense identity-less or that his identity hovered amidst a cultural construction of it. And again, this is something I discuss in more detail um, in, the, um, in the, the book. With his mother dead and estranged from his father, whom Gorky blamed for his mother de mother's death because he had abandoned them, for, abandoned them for so long, Gorky had to create for himself a legacy and inheritance. He created a self out of the history of art by the practice of making art. Even his choice of another artist's surname from the writer Maxime Gorky, itself a pseudonym, redoubles signification of the name as an artistic creation. Gorky's identity then cannot be separated from his art and is made up out of it. But his art, in turn, was indissociable from his status of, <coughs> of exile, both denying and embracing it, embracing it, as I have alluded to, in organization. And I want to point out also with organization, there's another aspect to Gorky's art, and that is he's very interested in surfaces. So all, almost all of his art has a landscape kind of quality to the surface. So, uh, so there's references to landscapes and memories, and then there is also um, surfaces that are themselves landscapes. And here's a close-up of two parts of organization when he's dealing with very, very thick paint. You'll see in later works that he's, he's dripping a little bit more and he's using a dry brush so that the textures change a little bit. The irony here is that throughout his career, Gorky developed an artistic process that relied upon memory as a superstructure into which he spliced observations from his present experiences. This is evident in a rudimentary manner in versions of Gorky's portrait, there we go, uh, portrait of the artist and his mother. And here is the National Gallery version of this. And on the left is the version that is probably the most well-known uh, of these versions, as well as one of the most well-known images of uh, Gorky's work. And this is, the one on the left is owned by uh, the Whitney Museum of American Art. Common are stories of how the artist painted and repainted the image, not only in various versions, but on this canvas itself, which Gorky is also believed to have obsessively scraped down, rinsed in his bathtub, and worked over and over in order to achieve the haunting and polished effect he desired of the image. This is a very unorthodox way of working with oil paint. Um, or perhaps it was a kind of incantation to resurrect his mother, at least visually in his painting, as if by engaging the, in obsessively the act of painting and repainting and scraping and reworking the surface somehow brought her alive, at least in that moment. Gorky moved in and out of using other images and artists as starting points for his paintings, and in turn had also begun to relate his works to uh, works from Armenia. This is a study of the work. Here, this is owned by the National Gallery of Art, Washington. And this is one of the most beautiful drawings I think I've ever seen. Um, this is a charcoal that he did of his mother as a study for these paintings. And this is owned by the Art Institute of Chicago. This was at the venue in Philadelphia, but they, it's so fragile because it's charcoal, and charcoal is a powder, could easily, um, can easily uh, um, dissipate with vibration. So it did not travel um, any place other than Philadelphia. And it took a lot of work to get it there. I've seen it in person, but only kind of in, uh, in the library and doing research um, at the Institute. There we go. Um, so this is image in Khorkum. And this is a 1934 to 36 image. And it's named for his boyhood home. In Gorky's late career, spanning roughly 1941 to 48, and often referred to as his breakthrough years, there's an increased and more visible splicing of past and present. We're going to see there. Okay. 
Um, part of this is due to time that he spent outside New York City uh, in Virginia and Connecticut, as many have noted, but it can also uh, be directly related to his permanence of his situation in America. It was during this era that Gorky married and began having a family, and it was indeed because of his wife and his wife's in-laws who owned a farm in Virginia that he went out to the landscape and started working from nature. Indeed, it is well documented that the need to form families was, just as was succeeding at a chosen profession, extremely important to survivors of trauma because it served as physical evidence, not only to others but to the survivors themselves, as an appearance of overcoming the past or having overcome the past. The enhanced attachment to the past works conversely as a response to Gorky's physical estrangement from the old country, even while exploring the work of European modern artists. Significantly, too, Gorky began to look at the landscape or scenes around him for inspiration. Gorky's work also became more abstract, and he engaged in numerous drawings that recreated and heightened the essence of an arrangement in front of him, such as depicted in the drawing Virginia Landscape, which was completed in 1944. Um, and again, uh, this was in the, le what led up to this was marriage with his wife Agnes. He was spending a great deal of time in the country in Virginia, and he was looking at the landscape, and you can kind of sense here, even though they're abstract form, you can kind of sense um, organic forms and, and flowers or, or um, kind of manifestations of worm-like forms. Um, so it might not have been one image they saw at one particular time, but he's kind of combining these different things that he's seeing um, and abstracting them on the canvas altogether. So what starts to happen is that Gorky used the landscape as a point of departure, though he also accessed images or idealizations of his childhood home. Just as Gorky trotted out his ethnic dances at New York parties, which you're seeing here, he mined his memory for old country experiences that in a, uh, in a way that often combine the past and present in abstract terms. For instance, the 1944 How My Mother's Embroidered Apron Unfolds in My Life is an abstraction based on a memory of how when he was a boy, his mother would hold his face close to her apron body and tell him folk tales. And that's a very kid thing to do, right? Gorky remarked that her stories and the embroidery on her apron got confused in my mind with my eyes closed. All of my life, her stories and her embroidery keep unraveling pictures in my memory. And this is also some place where he's he is melding the identifiable and the abstract. And just to kind of go back to the work, actually, I think I have a better, nope, I don't have a better one. Um, it it's, has the bright colors of Armenian embroidery, if you're familiar with um, uh, some of that work. Um, and he's using uh, some kind of medium like turpentine to kind of make these kind of drips and wash over the figure. Uh, over the what he's painted, but it's not entirely abstract. Um, there is an essence of an image that's kind of buried underneath here, and you can kind of look closely. I try to avoid identifying things in Gorky's art because it is abstraction, but this is a kind of transitional piece in that you have the sense of the colors of the embroidery and the, the, um, the yarn and almost the yarn-like web from the dripping and here you actually see um, kind of his headless mother, almost headless mother, um, in her same kind of apron uh, garb and uh, an image of a figure here with kind of the head leaning on her apron and then the body of the boy that's not completely washed out. There's an, there's an issue that I deal with in some of my work, too, in terms of he's, doing, he's dealing with simultaneous time and kind of melding time. And it's interesting because the figure of the body is actually more like Gorky as a man rather than uh, Gorky as a boy, the boy he would have been kind of laying his head on his mother's apron. So there's this kind of, there's this essence that he's remembering this as a man and then kind of thinking of him, uh, himself um, as a man almost going through that same kind of, of uh, story. Interestingly, it was when Gorky's life in America became permanent. After he became a citizen in the late 30s, married and started having children, and became more closely associated with the Surrealists that uh, 
the European artists who had created uh, art, an art that embraced the dream world and free association of Sigmund Freud and psychoanalysis, that he began to more, draw more strongly from his pre-genocide memories. And here he is with Andre Breton there on the right. So he's the leader of the Surrealist. He, Surrealist. He's actually a writer um, rather than an artist. And it was at that time, too, that his work became more abstract. As the renowned literary critic and exile Edward Said explains, exiles regard experiences as, as if they're about to disappear. What is it that anchors them in reality? What would you save of them? What would you give up? Only someone who has achieved the independence and detachment, someone whose homeland is sweet but whose circumstances make it impossible to recapture that sweetness, can answer those questions. Gorky could re never really return to his homeland, like all Armenians subjected to the Armenian genocide. What he knew was gone. Although the initial inspiration for many of Gorky's late works was the American landscape um, and repeated drawings of it, its subject was his childhood memories or places such as that garden in Korkum. The mutable quality of Gorky's work is evident in the Garden in Sochi series, which you can kind of see as a manifestation and a variation on the image in Korkum that I showed you earlier. Gorky used the American landscape as his inspiration, wedded it with his childhood memories, and worked through several versions that became more and more abstract. The memories had no real context, like Gorky had no fixed identity, and had to create one through renaming. In keeping with his Russian pseudonym, Gorky gave Korkom, the Russian pseudonym name of Sochi, a Black Sea resort, thus reinforcing the mutable quality of the proper name and its connection to the mutable quality of landscape in his art. And here again, I talked about the surface. The work on the left is a really heavy, thick surface like organization, and the work on the right is actually a, fairly, a, a dry brush technique, and it's actually a very, very thin surface that he's working with. And again, landscape and space themselves are mutable. Landscape changes with the seasons. And um, that's something that Gorky seems to be doing in memory and in his mind uh, with, a lot of, with his renditions of these works. Like the unfolding apron, Gorky's works from the series Garden in Sochi are examples of this reference to the sweet past. On the left is the 1941 version with the 1943 version on the right. Both may refer to the moment when Gorky's father left the family to go to America, giving his son a gift of traditional Middle Eastern slippers as a resemblance. The center motif was inspired by that scene, or, as Gorky told his wife, it was the shape of the Armenian goat skin butter churn. Oops, which I cannot. Oh, there we go, on the right. Uh, from the old country. And you can kind of see the women on the lower right hand corner. Um, with this goat skin hung on uh, what is basically an armature kind of looking like a cross of, of uh, twigs, branches. The garden itself was actually in Corky's home village of Korkum, but he reassigned it like he had himself a Russian identity. In these works, the shoes, flowers, and bird-like forms which might have existed in the original garden are transformed. Based on those memories and preliminary sketches, Gorky remade the images. Like in a dream, however, memory becomes distorted, but it can also be triggered by things in the present, such as the Virginia landscape, which reminded him of home, or a composition by another artist, such as the Catalan surrealist Juan Miro, which you're seeing there on the left. So all these things can really work into, um, can really work into uh, this melding of what he's doing in his art and this kind of mix of images and memories and time in his work. Margaret Bedosian, author of The Magical Pine Ring, a study of Armenian, Ameri uh, Armenian American immigrant literature, comments upon the effect of transplantation on the Armenian memory. The most significant features of this life lie beyond objective documentation. Only fleeting snatches of memory and the springs of dreams and nightmare can point toward what no longer exists exists, elusive as the taste of pure water or the scent of ripe apricots on a summer breeze, the memories of the Armenian immigrant nevertheless shaped his interior life concerns with the power of myth that replaces actuality after uprooting. 
Such a comment about dream and myth can literally be applied to Gorky's scent of apricots on the fields from 1944. And this is actually the image that's on the cover of my book. It's one of my favorite works. Um, of course, ripe apricots from Turkey or Armenia rather than those that have been kind of transported across uh, California um, <laughs> that are, tend to be a little hard and sour um, are just absolutely wonderful in their honey-like sweetness. And that's really what Quirky's remembering. Um, he also might have been remembering um, the drying of apricots on the roofs of homes as well, you know, in um, Middle Eastern cultures. Um, of course, we know we get Turkish apricots, right? Although they're processed now, um, they back along they would have been you know dried on the roofs, for instance, um, and you would smell that wafting, wonderful scent. <coughs> and this is what Gorky's re really remembering. It is literally the sweetness of what Said was speaking, that sweetness of the exile that can't be for some reason obtained. Gorky's relationship to his homeland as seen in the works he produced during the last decade of his life, is significant because it completely bypasses the genocide. Abstraction became Gorky's way to deal with the uprooting. Not depicting or referring to genocide became his way to address it. He denied it. Like Said's exile, whose circumstances make it impossible to recapture that sweetness, Gorky's memory of sweetness was interrupted by genocide. Like most first-generation Armenian immigrant immigrants, Gorky did not speak of his genocide experiences. Concurrently, it is no coincidence that throughout his life, Gorky's abstraction increased. Gorky used abstraction to produce a new reality that retains the sweetness of the past, by rejecting traumatic portions of it and replacing or splicing in present reality. Gorky created pungent compositions of fossilized organicism that were chains of images. In this manner, a picture is conceived as a system of relationships between objects and space in which parts are removed from their identity and made to function in a new manner and then are reorganized into a new synthesis that is abstraction. Ethel Schwabacher, Gorky's first biographer, referred to this process as producing imaginary gardens with real toads. Gorky, Gorky suggested that the, such manipulation produced a disorder, and through this, a new reality could be produced. He said of this process, the accidental disorder became the modern miracle through the denial of reality by removal of the object from its habitual surrounding a new reality was pronounced through these exilic landscapes gorky's work metaphorically became a mechanism for reconciliation of past and present these paintings are both of place and displacement as arshel gorky would not have existed if vosnik adoyan were not an exile gorky's art could not have existed either Abstraction served an important purpose for Gorky in the development of his identity and his art. It was a response to displacement. Gorky displaced images through abstraction because this was the only artistic mode that could include all of his worlds and balance the interaction between the real, the remembered, uh, and the created. Abstraction was used by Gorky to resolve the conflict of his historical situation. Perhaps Gorky used abstraction as a means to avoid the trauma of genocide, displacing it as it had displaced him. As I have said, although the initial inspiration for many of Gorky's late works seems to have been the American landscape, it was often mixed with his childhood memories of Horkom. As Gorky's work became increasingly abstract, it linked to the world in front of him and his memories of his old world. The series The Plow, is the, uh, the Plow and the Song, shown here as a version from 1946, for instance, was based on the song farmers used to sing in the old country while tilling the fields and is commonly understood to be based on the unique form of the Armenian plow. Such a combination of the observer, oh, and this is actually, um, there, Gorky made three of these, and they're small, kind of tabletop size. He made three of these. Um, this is version number one, and this one actually has a broken arm on it. kind of gives you an image of what those plows would have looked like. Such a combination of the observed and the remembered in Gorky's work 
can be called a remembering, the recombining or putting together of elements of images that he obser observed at one point in time with those recalled through memory that such scenes evoked. So again, place and time and reconfigurations of these are all kind of part of his art. Gorky remembered in parts based on what he had observed, which acted as a substitute. The idealized past was based on a sweetness that it existed in some form. When poet John Ash, traveling in Turkey near Gorky's home village, showed his guide some reproductions of Gorky's mature paintings, Ash says that the guide responded immediately, yes, these were the colors of Vaughn in spring and autumn. Gorky's representation functioned exactly as Andreas Hewson, an expert on comparative literatures and society, who has written widely on recent cultural and political phenomena of memory as a key concern in Western societies, has described. Representation always comes after, even though some media will try to provide us with the delusion of pure presence. Rather than leading us to some authentic origin or giving us veri verifiable access to the real, memory even, and especially in its belatedness, is itself based on representation. The past is not simply there in memory, but it must be articulated to become memory. The fissure that opens up between experiencing an event and remembering it in representation is unavoidable. Rather than lamenting or ignoring it, this split should be understood as a powerful stimulant for cultural and artistic creativity. Gorky's paintings were, as we have seen, places where, oh, back up there, places where identities are created and the past and present exist harmoniously. In some ways, this practice followed Freudian, the Freudian explanation of dreaming, which included four mechanisms, representability, condensation, displacement, and symbolization. In this process, an event or observation is encoded into memory, and the mind accesses it through a cue-based retrieval system, or, or a cue-based retrieval, meaning something triggers its immersion. The result is condensed or reduced to an essential form and relocated from its original context and inserted into the dream world where it symbolizes a feeling of fear, a, a feeling, a fear, or a key to desire, a dream facade. In the case of Gorky's art, dreams related to Gorky's practice of free association and visual stream of consciousness that began with representation of the observed. For Gorky, dreams, remembering, and representation were at the core of his artistic production. Through these exilic landscapes that were remembered through abstraction, Gorky's work metaphorically became a mechanism for reconciliation of past and present. By remembered, again, I mean reconstructed or put, to, put back together, mostly in a different form from the original or in a different way that something else had happened. When considering the relationship of the genocide to Gorky's work, particularly the aversion to rather than representation of it, it is useful to note that the term genocide itself was not coined until Raphael Lemkin did around the time of Gorky's breakthrough years. And um, this relates back to uh, Lemkin's uh, Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, um, published around 1943 to 44, although he originated the concept in the 1920s, um, and in the 1930s he tried to get, um, get uh, this uh, outlawed this kind of action outlawed by the lead of, uh, outlawed by the League of Nations, and at that point he called uh, he called it barbarity, which is what he called what, which what was how he referred to genocide and vandalism, which is how he referred to cultural genocide at the time. So he kind of then developed into the term of genocide or using that term genocide to describe these things. Um, and the importance of this is really twofold. First, it means that technically, although Turkey clearly carried out an or organized mass killing of a particular ethnic and religious group, there wasn't a label for their actions. It had no coherent identity, and accusations of killing were addressed as isolated or individual incidents rather than a campaign, despite the outcry of some individuals, such as the United States ambassador to Turkey at the time, Henry Morgenthau, who witnessed it. The second issue is one for the exiles and survivors of the genocide, and I would actually argue their, uh, their offspring as well. Horrible atrocities were committed against them, 
Yet few in the world community acknowledged it. The perpetrators were not held accountable, and the lack of a label or name for it meant that the victims had no way to explain what they had witnessed except on individual and very personalized terms. This meant that there was little broad-based acknowledgement of their trauma other than an image of the starving Armenians, which was not necessarily understood as linked to genocide, and many victims of the genocide were unable to mourn publicly. One of the reasons it's important to examine the way that this experience manifested itself in an artist like Gorky is because genocide is not specific to the Armenians or the Jews, because genocide continues to happen, um, for instance, Rwanda, U the former Yugoslavia, and Darfur. Gorky's trauma is perhaps difficult for us to understand in the 21st century because we have seen what can happen when suffering is internalized. A poignant example is related to the Vietnam War and what finally became known as post-traumatic stress disorder. Many veterans were not able to acknowledge their pain and speak about their experiences until they were actually allowed to do so publicly at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. In the same manner, Gorky's art was, in fact, a kind of coping mechanism, even though it did not address the genocide specifically. Because Gorky's psyche was tied up with memory and denial, he forged a kind of selective forgetting. Gorky, Gorky not only challenged memory as a noble object, but through his work shows that memory is selective. We remember some things and leave others out. It was a deliberate attempt to construct a new life and to withstand the trauma of the old one. As fe his fellow Armenian, the author William Saroyan stated, you remember only what your memory refuses to forget, and our memory will always, except in cases, uh, will always refuse to forget that which delights it or enriches it. Our memory, except in cases of amnesia, always forgets what deserves to be forgotten. And again, this makes sense in terms of amnesia and repressed memory. In Gorky's case, such forgetting is problematic because individual memory is tied to cultural memory. The individual memories that are pushed aside are Gorky's, but they are part of a cultural or collective memory that marks genocide. Gorky's selective forgetting is perhaps related to his own identity as a displaced person, particularly the cause of his displacement. And yet, because he used abstraction to pr express the past and refused to represent the genocide or present worlds that he's ba based his compositions upon, Gorky addressed his displacement in poetic terms through negating trauma in his art. Subjecting Gorky's individual story to this critique ultimately shows that um, Trauma, displacement, and memory act as an armature upon which Gorky's artwork is based. The splicing of selective memory and observed present created abstract compositions that were a new reality that was devoid of the unpleasant past and a manifestation of post-traumatic stress, which informs our understanding of abstraction and Gorky's unique place in the history of art. Agony, painted just months after a studio fire, colostomy operation, and increasing marital trouble, reflects the emotion of this era, not through recognizable images, but the use of glaring reds and Gorky's black line, thin and curved, connecting the composition like exposed nerves. The black lines both acted as inaccurate outlines to sections of the painting, as well as were incised into the painting, cutting outlines into it. These thin, nerve-like lines reflect the stretched, almost snapped nerves of Gorky's life. Although he continued to paint until the car accident at the end of June 1948, in which Gorky's neck was, neck was broken and his painting arm paralyzed, the devastation that Gorky felt after the accident contributed to the breakup of his marriage in mid-July. The security in which he tr had tried to build a new life around him gone, he no longer seemed able to cope with exile through art. Gorky lived out his narrative by hanging himself on July 21st, 1948. Gorky lived through his art, and since he could no longer do art, death was by his own hand. Arshil Gorky was extinguished by the will of the artist just as he had been created, a necessary resolution to the, com the completion of his exilic career.